All right. So our first speaker is John Mad Dog Hall. John, I hope this picture is okay with you. All right. Uh, so I first met John uh, many years ago. I won't say how many. Uh, at a local lug meeting, um, he was invited out to kind of speak, and uh, he explained to us why he got the name Mad Dog. And after he was done talking, we all realized, yes, it was the reason why he was given the name Mad Dog. Uh, so um, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to hand it over to John. John. Do you want to do it again? Yes. All right, let's do it again. Just the first one, Hilar. All right, there we go. I am here to talk about the history of FOSS. I want to take you back in time. The year is 1964. A single transistor will cost you $1.50. And that's a simple transistor. A power transistor will cost you $2.50. A gallon of gasoline will cost you 25 cents. <laughs> And so by the time you have a seven transistor radio, you can fill up your entire car with gasoline and, and go even faster. <laughs> so I, I had to have this because back in those days, it was the beginning of the hippie movement, tie-dye, you know, <laughs> summer of love, just a little bit later. And I was a high school student studying electronics. But then in 1969, I went to university. And 1969 was a magical year. Because in New Jersey, at Bell Laboratories, two guys started a little operating system that became known as Unix. Ken Thompson had been working on a project, a large project, called Maltics. It was supposed to be the be-all, end-all operating system for everything. But he was taken off of that and brought back to Bell Labs. He picked up a spare PDP-7 computer system from Digital Equipment Corporation. And he and Dennis Ritchie and a series of other people started working on this little operating system called Unix that was supposed to be the be-all, end-all thing for one person. A little while later, they moved it to a PDP-11. And this became one of the most used machines in the early days of Unix. Now, why was this important? Because up until this point, people wrote operating systems that was tuned to a specific hardware and tuned to a specific purpose. And you bought a machine that did a specific type of job. Unix ended up being a small system that was very portable across hardware. And this meant you could have exactly the same operating system when you had different pieces of hardware from different vendors. This was the first time that an operating system was taking advantage or allowing you to, to save your training, to save your applications, to have it go across different pieces of hardware. Also in 1969, the beginning of the internet. This is known as an IMP. This is one of the endpoints of the ARPANET. You would have one of these in every endpoint you had, and then you connect your computer systems to them. And so from this was the very beginning of what we call 
the internet and the World Wide Web today. Also in 1969, little recognized in any place except two people in Helsinki, Finland, a baby was born. That baby's name was Linus Torvalds. That's how you say it, by the way, Linus Torvalds. It's not Linux Torvalds or Linux Torvalds. But he gave up trying to convince people how to say it, so he doesn't care what you call it as long as you use it. Also in 1969, was, I was a university student, and I came, became familiar with this organization called DICAS, the Digital Equipment Corporation User Society. Now, as I mentioned before, back in those days, you had a computer, and if it had an operating system, sometimes they didn't. Sometimes when you wrote your application, you linked the device drivers into your application and booted your application. It didn't have an operating system. It ran one program at a time. And there were very few computers of one architecture or one type. So when you wrote your program, you typically wrote it for a specific computer, maybe in a higher level language like Fortran or COBOL. Notice I didn't say Fortran 4, Fortran 77, high performance Fortran, Fortran 99, or any of that because there was only going to be one language called Fortran. That and punching cards was all you needed. However, you also had commercial software because your mainframe computer might cost two and one half million US dollars. And that's when a million dollars was a lot of money. And since you're only running one program at a time on it, you want that program to be as efficient as humanly possible. And so if you could buy a compiler that would give you 10% better performance on your program, that's like you got back $250,000 of your investment of your computer. And so you would pay 100,000 US dollars for this commercial compiler. And when it showed up at your facility, it came on a nice 12-inch, nine-track magnetic tape attached to an engineer who would spend the next week there getting that compiler to assemble and then compile itself on your computer system. And then you would run a series of tests to show the compiler was supposedly doing what it was supposed to do and then the engineer would go away. But you would keep that tape, and you had the source code for it because you had purchased that software, and it belonged to you. There was no copyright on software back in those days. There was no patents that applied to software back in those days. You bought the software, and you typically bought it under a contract, contract law, was what applied. However, there was also a place called Dicus. IBM had Share. Novell had Brainstorm or something like that. And these were user groups. Because also in 1969, the concept of being a professional programmer really didn't exist. If you did programming, it's because you were an electrical engineer and you needed the computer to help you do your work. You were a civil engineer and you needed the computer to do your work. You were a chemical engineer. You were a mathematician. You were a physicist. You weren't a programmer who wrote programs for somebody else. In fact, I had a university professor tell me in 1973, John, you will never make it as a professional programmer. And I'm still trying to figure out if he was correct. <laughs> but in any case, all these people took and wrote their software to help them do their job. And then they said, what am I going to do with it? Because selling software is hard work. If you're going to sell software to somebody, you have to write documentation. You have to have some way of fixing problems. You have to point it to different pieces of hardware. You have to do all these things. 
And these people were not professional software writers. They were physicists, educators. And so they contributed their software to Dicas, or Share, or Mindstorm. And the people who used that equipment could then get a catalog, look up, and say, ah, oh, there's a text editor. And I can use that text editor on my hard copy terminal right there. And I can pay $5 for that text editor and get it on paper tape. And so you set away for that. But as a college student, $5 was still a lot of money. Because back in those days, that $5 could buy you 10 pitchers of beer. <laughs> and so you had this choice, you know, a text editor or 10 pitchers of beer. I think you can see in what direction I normally went. <laughs> but the great thing about it was that this was free software. Once you got that paper tape, you could make as many copies of it as you wanted to. In fact, they encouraged you to do that. And so I went to the school store, I'd buy the, the paper tape, I'd make copies, and I would sell it to my roommates for a dollar a copy. So after I sold my 10 copies, I not only had my $5 back, but I had my 10 pitchers of beer. <laughs> so I was having a living, making a living, selling free software back in 1969. 1969 was also the last time I shaved. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't talk too much about that. Ah, now, moving forward a little bit, remember these guys in Bell Laboratories were making this operating system called Unix. Well, by 1975, there was a whole series of people using Unix. Not only the people in Bell Laboratories, but people at Western Electric that was the manufacturing arm of the telephone company. Universities and uh, lots of other people were using this little operating system called Unix because it was so flexible and ran across all these different pieces of hardware. And in 1975, people were still distributing Unix in source code. And we would have these wonderful meetings, a lot like this, where people would get together and exchange ideas about how to make Unix better. And people would give up and give a talk about Unix and tell them about what they had done. Except in 1975, this one company came in and gave a great talk about what they were doing with Unix. It was fantastic, it was wonderful. And people said, hey, I'd like to help you with that. Let's go down to the machine room, bring your tape, we'll exchange the software and stuff. And they said, I can't do that because my company is putting out a binary only distribution of Unix. And they don't allow me to give you the source code. Boo! Hiss! Boo! Hiss! But that was the way it was. And the next year at Usenix, there were a couple more companies that said, no, no, we're only putting out a binary-only distribution. Why? Because to see the source code of Unix, you need to pay AT&T 160,000 US dollars for your first computer. And you had to tell them what the serial number of that computer was. How many of you know the serial number of your laptop right off the top of your head? Yeah, that's what I thought. Slackers. <laughs> and for the second computer, that was another $160,000. And for the third computer, that's another $160,000. This is because it's a telephone company, and they didn't understand volume discounts. <laughs> but for a binary-only copy, not only was it only $350, but you didn't have to tell them what the serial number of your computer was. This made it a lot easier for these companies to put out versions of Unix that they could sell into the mass marketplace. But what it meant was that more and more at all these different Unix conferences, people would not share the source code of what they were doing. And Usenix eventually became used to this, and there was no more booing and hissing. In 1983, there was a thing at MIT called Project Athena. And this was a movement by 
the, the schools, because universities could get Unix for $350 for a site license, a source code. Because universities were research universities that AT&T saw, yes, they're helping us develop this Unix thing. I happened to be teaching at a small two-year technical college called Hartford State Technical College. We were not a research university. And if I wanted to show my students the source code for Unix, it would have cost me $160,000. And of course, my deed of instruction would just laugh at me for that. But at MIT, a research university, they were developing a version of Unix that would go across lots of different workstations. And they developed this thing called the X window system, which we use today. They also developed a security system that went across the network called Kerberos. Now, the reason I'm telling you about this is because of the next slide, where we're going to be talking about 1984 and a certain gentleman at MIT by the name of Richard Stallman. Richard was a student at MIT, and he liked looking at the source code for Unix systems, and he liked seeing how the source code was written, and he liked being able to adapt his codes to use things like printers and stuff without having to pay a lot of money. And he was disturbed that these Unix systems that had been open source code that he could see were now being closed. So he decided to start this project called GNU, which stands for GNU is not Unix. And then later on, he started a foundation to create an entire operating system that would be free and open source. And he started with this program called Emacs, a text editor. And a lot of people say he could have stopped with Emacs <laughs> because it was like an entire operating system in a text editor. But he went on, and he did a compiler suite, and he did a lot of other things, and he was gathering up all this software. Now, the interesting part, some people might say, is why didn't he start with the kernel? Well, by developing things like a text editor that was portable across different operating systems, he was showing people that you could have something useful that was the same interfaces going across these different systems. And he got people excited about working on that. Same thing with the compiler suite. He had a set of compilers that used exactly the same syntax and semantics in the compiler, no matter what operating system it was on. And this gave a level of, of programming capability that people were not used to. If he had started with the kernel in 1984, he could have finished that and we would have a very interesting 1984 type of kernel today, but nothing to run on it. So he went the opposite direction. So by, 19, oh, by 1991, most of this operating system, most of the software that could possibly go in this operating system was done. Whether it came from Unix or whether it came from BSD, the Berkeley Software Distribution, or whether it came from MIT, or whether it came from a lot of different places, a lot of the software was done except for the kernel. And remember that kid who was born in, 1990, in 1969, Linus, because by this time, he was a university student at the University of Helsinki, and he had just gotten a brand new 386 system which wouldn't do what he wanted it to. Now, it came with an operating system on it. It came with this operating system called Windows. But Windows didn't, couldn't take advantage of the chip. Why not? What was new about the 386 architecture that had not been in Intel systems before? Wait a minute, you said, somebody out there said it. Demand page virtual memory. The 286 and the 186 and all the systems before could support swapping style of memory, but not demand page virtual memory. And Linus understood that there was an operating system that could do that, 
but the operating system was called Unix, and he couldn't afford any of the Unix systems that were there, so he decided to write his own, just for fun. Just a little project. It wasn't going to be as big and important like Minix or anything like that. And so he sent out a message to a lot of people and said, hey, I'm working on this. Would you like to join me? And people answered back and said yes. Now, originally, he wanted to call the operating system Freaks, F-E-R-E-A-X. But the person who was going to put the software up in the net for people to pull down said, no, no, we're not going to call it Freaks. We're going to call it Linux. And the history comes out. Now, by 1994, the kernel was to the point where there was a good enough kernel to be able to handle some problems. And so version 1.0 of the kernel came out, and a lot of people started making distributions. One of the first ones was a, a distribution called SOS, or Soft Landing Systems. Another one was a fantastic distribution called Yggdrasil. Unfortunately, they were a little bit ahead of their times. Those, those, those ones no longer exist. However, Slackware came along rapidly, and Slackware still exists today. Patrick Volkering, very excellent gentleman, is at the head of that distribution. And then other ones which we heard of, like Debian and Red Hat and SUSE, Connectiva and others came out. People say there's too many distributions. I don't find this as a problem. I can go back and forth between these different distributions. But, you know, when I find one I like, I stay with it. So I don't care if there's 350 other distributions. I like this one. I stay with it. No problem. In 1994, I was working for Digital Equipment Corporation in the Unix group. And I heard about this person who had done something with software. And one of the people in our user group wanted to bring this person to Dekus. Remember Dekus? Still around. Wanted to bring them to Dekus in New Orleans. Now, in the United States, there were two places that are called the adult Disneyland. One is Las Vegas, and the other is New Orleans. I love New Orleans. <laughs> and I heard about this person, and, and I says, well, OK, we'll, we'll bring this person down to Dekus, and they can show off their software. And we did. And I saw Linux for the first time. Now, one of the things you can do in New Orleans is you go out on the Natchez. And I took Linus out on the Natchez, and we're going along, and I said, Linus, this is, I, I've seen Linux now. I understand what the model is. It's really great. But you know, it's only on Intel. It's only 32-bit. What would you think about taking it to a 64-bit system like Digital's Alpha, the world's fastest microcomputer, a RISC architecture so you can get some of the Intel-isms out of the kernel? Now, what is an Intel-ism? If you are a programmer and you're trying to do very, very efficient code, sometimes you take advantage of the architecture of the specific processor to do something, a little hack. And that's OK until the processor architecture changes underneath of you, or you try and make the kernel portable to a different system. And then that little hack blows up in your face. And so what you want to do is try and make the operating system separated into two parts, device-independent part that does all the things like scheduling, memory, higher levels of memory management, things like that, and the lower part, which does the things that are specific to a specific architecture. And Lena said, yes, I'd love to do that, but I've been having problems getting an alpha system from the digital office in Helsinki. And so I may have to do the PowerPC instead. Ah! <laughs> that is a wrong answer. Don't do that. And so I went running back to my office at digital, and I called up a friend of mine. Now, you will be told that the way you get things done in a large corporation is that you write a product plan, you send it to your management, 
a business plan, a marketing plan. They consider it, they look at it, stuff like that. Let me tell you, that's not how it's done. You call in favors. And I'd worked for digital for 16 years up to that point, and people owed me a lot of favors. And so I called up this person named Jim Jackson, and I said, Jim, I don't have time to tell you who this is or what they've done, but I need to have an alpha system sent to Helsinki, Finland right away. What can you do for me? And this is a time where not even the engineers in digital had all the alpha systems they needed. It's also a time where the system I was asking him to send was worth 30,000 US dollars. And Jim sent it off with no more than that as justification. Now, the other thing you need to think about is that we started this port. In, in May of 1994, I met Linus, got in the system. He wanted to take time to think about what he was doing and also to bring out version 1.2 of the kernel because he wanted to stabilize version 1.0, fix all the bugs, handle all the problems, and then he would start thinking about this port to make Linux 64-bit and to make it portable. Because Linus didn't want to have a, 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 a source code tree that only supported two architectures. He wanted it to support N architectures, as many as he wanted to. And so he started to divide up the code in his mind that way. Now, you bring out a system like that, and we started the actual port January the 1st, 1995. By November of 1995, the port was done, and Red Hat had brought out an alpha distribution on CD. Nine months, approximately nine months. This was the fastest I had ever seen a port of this type done, and done by people who were not working for the same company, who were volunteers, and a lot of them never saw each other face to face. Truly amazing. But now we had an operating system that basically had no applications for it. You say, what do you mean no applications? It's all those neat little commands and stuff in Linux and Unix. That's true. But no databases, no office packages, nothing like that. What do you do? with something like that. Well, one of the first uses of, Unix, of Linux was to repurpose older hardware. You had gotten a brand new Intel system. You naturally had Windows on that. But you had the older system, too. What are you going to do with that? Well, if you give it to somebody else, you have to buy another Microsoft license for that because you don't own the software. So you have to buy another copy and put that on the older equipment. That may cost you $400. But with Linux, you can just put it on for free and repurpose that machine to do something else. What could you use with it? You could use it as a router. You could use it as a small server. And what was happening at about the same time was this gentleman created this thing called the World Wide Web. And all of a sudden, we had these people who had been using Spark systems with Solaris find out that they could use a cheap Intel PC with Linux to do the same thing, to create a shell account, to put a, a web server on it. And so Linux started to be the favorite of the ISP. And one more thing. Because you had the source code, if there was a bug in the system, if there was a virus attack, if there was something like that, you could fix it yourself. And this was very important if what you're selling are services to other people. There was a very famous worm that happened called the Morris worm. And Digital Equipment Corporation finding out that the worm existed and understanding what the problem was, took two weeks to generate, the, generate and test the patch and distribute the patch to our customers. That was for the system that we still supported. An older system that we dropped support, it took us three months to develop the patch for that, and we almost didn't do it. 
The free software community within four hours of understanding the problem had the source code patch up on the web. In 1995, there was another problem. Supercomputer companies like Cray and ECL were going out of business because they would design a very expensive, very complex system, and then they would sell five of them. Uh, two of them typically to universities, another two to some of these, these organizations we dare not say their name, and then one would disappear someplace. And they were going out of business, so two people from NASA, Donald Becker and Thomas Sterling, developed this concept called the Beowulf supercomputer, or high-performance computing, of taking inexpensive PCs, dividing up the application, and having them do amazing work. You could, you could get 40 times the power, the computing power, for the same amount of money, or only have to pay 1 40th of what you would pay for a supercomputer to get your computing power you needed. That created another market for Linux. In 1998, Informix announced that they were going to port their database engine. In fact, they not only announced it, but released the code on the same day. That was overshadowed, overshadowed by a company called Oracle, who found out they were going to do this, and announced that sometime in the future, Oracle would port to Linux. And of course, that took all the press away from Informix. But over the next couple of months, the database companies all ported. And this gave a vision of legitimacy to Linux. Then finally, in the year 2000, almost overnight, all of the embedded system companies decided to use Linux. And Linux became the most used operating system in new embedded system designs. Why? Why did this happen? Because up until that point, a lot of the embedded system companies developed their own operating system. A lot of times they had to use their own compilers. But in the year 2000, something special happened. They all of a sudden realized these things now have to talk to each other on this magical thing called the internet. And this means you need to have a network stack. And that's a hard thing to do. And the other thing is, you have to have an operating system that is stable and secure and typically multitasking, maybe multi-user. And if you're going to create 100,000 kiosks, you don't want to have to pay 100,000 royalties. And so they looked around, and the operating system they chose was Linux. So this brings us up really to the end of my talk. The next person is going to talk about Linux of today. And I didn't want to get too far into their talk. So thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, John. All right, so as John mentioned, our next speaker is going to speak about the present of, of free and open source software, um, Joe New Bacon. He knows a little bit about the free and open source community. I think he wrote a book. Some people may have read it. No, Joe knows saying no, no one bought it. <laughs> Did your wife buy it? No, she didn't buy it either, okay. I, I have a copy. Someone gave it to me, though. I think they stole it. Oh, you, that's right, you gave it to me, that's right. Uh, all right, so uh, I'm, I'm going to shut up now and welcome Joan on to the stage. All right. How's everyone doing? So before we go on, I just... It's, I think it's important that we give one of the most inspirational people in the free software world a huge round of applause. I love this man. Um, okay, so I'm here to talk about the present. Um, I think it's quite simple. We've won. So 
I think we're, we, we are living in an incredible time when it comes to open source and free software. Um, and we've just seen such a remarkable amount of growth in, in the last 10, 15 years. I got in, interested in this in 1998 when my brother um, told me that Windows was a Mickey Mouse operating system, installed Slacker on my, on my computer, left the login details on the screen, and then moved out. If you want, if you want a hardcore introduction to the Linux, that's going to be it. Um, what's interesting to me is that we've seen so many interesting uh, examples of success, um, not just in the Linux world, but in the open source and the open culture world as well. So Wikipedia, for example, is, was valued at tens of billions of dollars by the Smithsonian. We've got Red Hat, who I think have now got to be in a $2 billion open source company, the first billion dollar open source company. Of course, Linux is powering devices in our pockets, in stock markets, in industrial systems and elsewhere. OpenStack completely disrupted the cloud and democratized it in a way that we didn't have a single provider who was dominating that because we know how that works in the, in the software world. Uh, and then, of course, we've got millions of repos in GitHub where people are building software uh, for a wide variety of purposes all of the time. So you don't have to look very far. You know, you don't need me to teach you all uh, how impressive open source is in the present. Um, what's exciting to me is that we've not just got those meaningful projects, but we've got stupid projects as well, such as Hannah Montana Linux, uh, which I think some people actually use. Um, uh, Gareth, yeah. Um, <laughs> one of those 300 distros that Mad Dog was talking about. Um, and then you've got, for example, did anyone hear about the hacker scripts? This guy basically worked somewhere and uh, left, left his job, and his co-workers found a bunch of scripts that he used to automate his life. One was called hangover.sh, which would periodically check if he was logged into the server, and if it wasn't at a, period, a certain time in the morning, it would automatic, automatically send his boss an email with a predefined excuse from a list. Uh, and he also wrote a script called coffee.sh, which would basically connect to the coffee ma maker in the office, which no one knew you could connect to with Telnet, and it would brew a cup, wait 24 seconds, which was the exact time it took him to walk from his desk to the coffee maker to pick it up. So we get people, you, the open source spirit and mentality and methodology is, is not just being used for really remarkable projects, such as the ones a couple of slides back, for, but for cases like this as well. Now, when I started out, I had a machine that looked a little bit like this. This is running DOS, though. Um, and what was exciting to me was that this essentially connected me as an 18-year-old living in the middle of England to an electronic world where I could play a role. And it was the, the combination of the internet and computing power and open tools that, that made that interesting. What is exciting about the present, in my mind, is that we've seen this remarkable growth in computing power. So we've seen, you know, more, everybody was probably familiar with this, the growth of computing curve which means that in 2025, a $1,000 computer will be as powerful as a human brain, for example. And we can use this for data-intensive tasks. We've seen tremendous examples of this, such as Mycroft in the AI world and big data and various other uh, cases. But we've also seen a remarkable growth of internet access as well. So now we're getting powerful computing mixed with uh, ubiquitous internet access and open tools, and that opens up all kinds of interesting possibilities. And what's happened here, I think, is my slides aren't working. Um, cheap computing drones and 3D printing. Um, what we're seeing here is we're seeing this birth of all kinds of interesting technologies. So cheap computing such as Arduino and Raspberry Pis. We're seeing 3D printing uh, such as the MakerBots and the 3D systems, uh, uh, the 3D systems printers. We've got drones such as the 3D Robotics Solo. Uh, we've seen open source, this huge library of open source uh, for building anything from compilers to games to anything else. Of course, the massive growth in the cloud. And there's always been traditionally a problem, I think, between connecting innovators to the consumers. People have been working on and hacking on interesting problems for many years, but crossing that divide has been very difficult. And crowdfunders essentially open that up so the public can be your VC. And what's exciting to me is that all of these things are infused with openness. You know, if you look at, if you look at each of these different areas, people are doing things with open source and open projects. The, the majority of Kickstarter and Indiegogo campaigns I seem to see have got some kind of open source bent to it. And this has opened up a world where, when I started out with that computer, I never had any of this technology available. So what we've got today available for every single person in this room is really inspiring. And this means that we see projects such as this. 
The 3D Robotics uh, Solo, which is this drone up here, Linux powered, it's got two Linux computers in it. You can build um, custom hardware that will hang on, on the bottom of this drone. You can access it and get data from the drone. This thing is incredible. It's like a games console for the sky. And then you've got things like the, the Mycroft, which I'm a big fan of, which is open hardware, open source, open services, just a way in which we're able to, again, democratize artificial intelligence. So we're not just seeing really interesting open source projects. We're seeing all these interesting open hardware projects as well. And the reason why I think this is happening is because what we've seen in the last 10 years and what we're seeing today is that open source is where society innovates. This is where we're not just, uh, not just learning how to build interesting things, but this is where we learn how to work together around code, to work together around open documentation, to how do we bring um, a group of people together to build interesting things in the most effective way possible. And open source has just become this fascinating laboratory for where we're exploring different ways of doing this. And events like Scale help to iterate that every single year. But we can do better. So before I start, stop rambling about the present, I think there's some things in the present that are not perfect. It's not 100% rosy. I think there's two things that we can figure out moving forward. The first thing is, is figuring out how we can bring the worlds of atoms and bits and bytes together. So we've got hardware communities that do interesting things. We've got software communities. The openness in hardware and the openness in software has opened up this world where we're going to be collaborating around 3D, uh, uh, around hardware projects with 3D printing and uh, firmware and open source and various other pieces. So this is a really exciting scope. It's kind of like, it, it's kind of like the, the, original, the original map of how people work together in different ways in projects has become 3D. And we now have got multiple layers in how people collaborate together uh, around hardware as well as software. But the other thing is figuring out how we build effective communities, which is obviously something I'm somewhat passionate about. You know, how we go from an idea through to implementation. I feel like we've We've doing, we're doing some incredible work here across a wide variety of open source projects, but we haven't quite figured that out as well. And what this culminates to is that when I started out and I had that computer, and the, the course of my career, the technology that's become available to me, when I think about people like this, which is my three-year-old little boy, and we think about what we're opening up for him in the future, it's going to be a pretty inspiring place. Thank you. Good. All right. Thanks, Jono. Um, I'm going to predict that 2016 is going to be the year of Hannah Man Montana Linux. <laughs> Mark my words. All right. So our final speaker in the Floss Reflections uh, talk. You have one more of your son. Three of your son. There we go. All right. So our next speaker is Kayla Banks. Um, So for those that don't know, myself and, and various other scale people, we've been doing this for 14 years. Kayla has been attending scale before she was born. None of us can claim that. Uh, so I'm going to welcome Kayla up to the stage. Kayla is going to talk to us about the future of free and open source software. Thank you, Gary. So first I want to talk about, <clears throat> well, me. They invited me here because, well, I like to encourage kids to get into open source, and I talk about open source for about four years now. But really, since I'm representing the future, they could have asked everybody in this room to, op to represent open source because, well, how I like to explain it is my own personal experience. <clears throat> I have a lemon tree in my backyard, and you know, California soil is pretty bad. And so, well, what if one of those lemons want to just fall on the floor and <clears throat> grow their own lemon tree? <clears throat> I like to call that the present. <clears throat> 
and that means the older people. They are the ones who enrich the soil for us. And I, the lemons, are the one who make new trees. And that's why I like to call everybody the future because everyone is involved in making new and better trees. <clears throat> Oh, well, I guess the cooker's not working, so I guess I'll just talk. <laughs> so first I want to talk about what I see in the open source. I want to kind of agree with John. <clears throat> the present was a pretty awesome decade for open source. Everything was awesome. And so you might be thinking, well, what can we improve on? Well, the main thing that we need improvement on it's connection. Just think about it. We might have social networks that connect us to people, but are we really connected? I mean, if anyone's watched Back to the Future, 2015 was supposed to be mind reading. <laughs> and it's actually not too far from it. <clears throat> I like to, I like to, oh, thanks. I like to predict the future as the year of connectivity. And one thing that makes this possible is a way of life I like to say is Internet of Things. <clears throat> Actually, my friend Jasmine Cruz's dad, John Cruz, works for Samsung's company, Tizen. Tizen is supposed to be a operating system that's not just operating on your computer. It's supposed to be on your phones, your TVs, your smart watches, anything that has a device or it has a screen is pr probably going to be run on. <laughs> I think Internet of Things and ties in is, might be the future of open source. And so now that we talked about what the future is, let's talk about things we need to improve in the future. And so the, big, the biggest thing I think that prevents kids and other people from joining open source is a lack of support for gaming. That's mainly why I go on my Windows partition for gaming, because, well, when I, got it, when I put Ubuntu on my computer, it was very, very hard to run Sims 3 and add, still have all the compatibility and support for all my mods and hacks. So, <laughs> Yeah, you know us kids, we like to play video games. So in Linux, this is, our, this is what we're known for, it's bad at it. And actually, this is kind of a recurring issue in my family since we're big time gamers. And so <clears throat> you can also check out my brother Hunter Banks who, wrote, who writes for Phosphorus Magazine. He writes a little bit more about that issue too, so you should check it out. <laughs> And next, I want to talk a little bit more broad than just philosophy reflections. If you look in the acronym FLOSS, you see that there's software. Well, in the future, I predict open source is going to be way more than software. There's a huge industry that I think open source can take over, and that's hardware. And I think we can start with 3D printing. Yeah, 3D printing already exists, but I mean, do you th when you think of 3D printing, do you think about printing out a phone case or do you think about printing out a house? It's possible, and it's already happening in China, actually. We're way behind our game, open source. <laughs> in the future of open source, we are going to take away, we, open source community, we're going to dominate 3D printing, even if it's houses. Our dad actually has a friend named Jonah who takes over open source architecture. Yeah, open source architecture. They make houses that are made from biofuels using blueprints that are all open source. So that's just a little bit of what I think. And going back to what I said first, everyone in here is open source. And so that means even the little girl I met this morning, Zoe, if you have any ideas or anyone 
in, in this room that has ideas of what you can bring into open source, don't be afraid to share it. Oh, and also, if you want to learn a little bit more about the future, I'm having a talk, the automated team, on Saturday at 1.30. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kayla. Um, so we have a few minutes before uh, Brian Lunduk's uh, talk. Um, for those of you who hadn't seen, um, it was all over the internet, so I imagine it's most of you, uh, the free and open source community uh, had a big loss um, a couple of weeks ago. Ian Murdoch passed away. Uh, so I wanted to invite Jono and John uh, back on stage just to say a few words about Ian and kind of their memories of him. I didn't know Ian Murdoch very well. I only met him a few times. But he was the person who started the Debian operating system. And I think that Debian is unique in a lot of ways. Because a lot of the different distributions of Linux, um, or GNU Linux, if Richard's around, uh, they started as a single person doing it, or they started as a company doing it, or, you know, but with Debian, it was first the concept of what are we going to do? Why are we doing this? And they formed a community of people with a structure to it that allowed Debian to grow. Debian is not just a distribution. It's, in effect, a distribution creator. And so a lot of the distributions that we look at today, such as Ubuntu, Canopix, and others, are built on top of the packages which are created by the Debian community of people. They take this very, very seriously. They elect their project leaders. They use uh, encryption to sign their packages. They have a very set goals to maintain quality of their systems. And they have a series of different systems, one of which is very stable, long-term support, and then others which are less stable, development systems. So I think it was fantastic that Ian way back when they started the Debian system, thought this far ahead. And yes, we have lost a very good guy who was very modest, very intelligent, and it was a shame that he died. I wish he had been around a lot longer. Um. <clears throat> Like Mad Dog, I wouldn't profess to have known Ian um, hugely. I mean, he was somebody who, um, years back, I was, I got an email from him once um, with some feedback about some of the stuff that we were doing in Ubuntu. Uh, eventually met him at a conference. I think it was Linux Targ, if I remember. And I feel quite fortunate in the fact that throughout the course of my career, I've got to meet most of my heroes in the Linux and the free software world. And he was probably one of the first for me. I remember meeting him and being gen genuinely tingly about it. Because he was, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have a lot of what we have today. It wasn't, to Mad Dog's point, Debian is not just software. It's a, it's a way of life. It's a methodology that has inspired so many other projects. Um, and it's always nerve-wracking when you meet your heroes because you're not really sure what they're going to be like. And it was amazing to me that he was more interested in me than me expressing interest in him. He was genuinely a humble human being. Um, and from time to time, you know, I'd bump into him. He would usually be hanging out the front of a, uh, a conference, having a cigarette or something. 
And uh, every single time, he was just such a given person. To the point whereby, he, I don't think he really ever knew or acknowledged you know, his level of uh, accomplishment in the work that he did. So you know, we'd invite him to, we invited him to Lug Radio Live, which is a ludicrous event uh, for a person as, with a statue of uh, Ian Murdoch. But he came along. He was happy to participate at every step. And I think that's what makes his loss such a difficult thing to deal with. So, but I think you know, from the little bit that I did know him, he wouldn't want us stood here, you know, looking blue about it. So we'd, he'd want us all having fun and continuing free software and open source and having a good time. So, thank you. Nice to